Breathing in again. Oof, let's get comfortable. Whatever comfortable is for you and the opportunity that you have and the space that you have to do this. I appreciate just the fact that you're here. And um, let's optimize this time together by closing our eyes. Deep, deep breaths, deep directed breaths, filling up this human cavity with space and air and life, letting that breath be directed to any place within you that might need some special attention. We just focus on our ability and the precious gift of breath. And it is in this pausing and in this activity that we say thank you. Thank you to life. And we welcome that inherent wisdom. I love the idea that it is inherent, meaning that it is already there. It is already a substantial part of who and what we are. The inherent wisdom of the ancients. It's going to reactivate or remember through us right now. We welcome the power of the ancients to flow through us. And we welcome the love of the ancients to create, to create, express, be, share, support one another as that, as the love of the ancients. So all of this unconditional, beautiful, inherent part of us, we just give it space. We give it permission now to be activated, to be fully present, to be receptive. May we hear with, with uh, divine ears. May we hear exactly what it is that we need. May we receive with an open heart exactly what it is that is particularized in order to bring us comfort, to bring us peace, and to bring us clarity. This is our prayer. This is our invitation. And together we say, and so it is. Good morning, good morning. Hello. Lots happening in our world, right? Lots happening in our world. Maybe you are experiencing the same heightened sense of uncertainty. So I want to dedicate our time today to to bringing solution to that. What's been going on for me in terms of awareness all week is this idea that our worth, our worth is the thing we interface with in response to and behaviors to all things, our worth. So our degree of worth. If I'm conscious that my degree of worth could use some refreshing, then I'm conscious of the fact that that noticing and that awareness that somehow I'm, I'm off track or I'm, I need to course correct is the thing that is the influence in the way I interface in talking to other people and going to work and the way in which I look at all of the quadrants of my life, my relationships, my creativity, my health, all of those things, when you granularly bring it down, interface with one's belief in their own worth. It's been on my mind all week. And that if there was really only one topic or one exploration for us, philosophically, spiritually, physically, it would be what do we really believe we are worth? What, what do we really believe about ourselves and about our, uh, our, our right to be? Because whatever that is, if we want to label it as a degree on a thermometer of worth, wherever we are in the degree or the placement of that thermometer is the direct interfacing, again, with all the ways in which we are interacting with the world, with the outside world, with other people. And it doesn't matter how much we try to mask it or fake it or force it. That inward belief, that, that sort of knowing, the, the understanding or the revelation or the return to 
an inherent sense of worth, simply meaning that there's nothing to do to earn the worth. You, you and I are just worth. We are worthy. That unless we that unless we move that sort of to the top of our hierarchy of exploration, then no matter how hard we try in the external world, that placement, that relationship with worth, will still be the major influencer in the way in which we perceive and the way in which we are perceived, right? And so I was thinking about a an experience when I lived in Los Angeles and um, was being very frugal and I had this small tiny little patio in the place that I lived and I wanted a patio table. Budget didn't really allow that and lo and behold if when I was out driving one day there was a patio table on the side of the road. So I picked it up and I brought it home I um, washed it, rinsed it off, and got a fresh coat of paint, and I painted it. And I was so pleased with myself for having found this, this, this patio table, which was exactly something that I wanted. But over a, a short period of time, the paint began to crack and peel. And no matter what I did to touch it up, it would continue to crack and peel. And it finally dawned on me to turn it over. And when I turned it over, it was all rusted. The rust was so thick and so pronounced that the, the actual surface that I was seeing on the top that I had painted and the actual rust infestation was really quite thin. And no matter what I did, uh, nothing was going to remove that rust. And the lesson and the metaphor was not lost on me, that oftentimes we can spend a lot amount of time in shortcuts or fines and try to gloss over things. But if there is rust underneath, if the rust is the foundation, then the rust will always seep through, very much like our worth. And as I continue to ponder that and think about that, it reminded me also of one of the great philosophical examples called Plato's Cave. If you've ever been interested in philosophy or studied philosophy, you will know that this is one of the seminal teachings. And Plato gave the example that there are slaves who are chained to the wall in a cave and behind them is a fire and the guards or other people who are in the cave as they walk by with certain objects those objects cast a shadow on the wall because of the fire the prisoners being chained in one direction only see the shadows and so their perception of reality is the shadows and there are different nuances to the story one prisoner breaks free manages to escape the cave, goes out, has never seen sunlight before, and so he is blinded by the sunlight, stumbles back into the cave. So now the perception of the prisoners is that it's even worse by escaping. And so however it is that you want to place this analogy of Plato's cave is that what we are experiencing are perceptions that are being broadcast from our understanding of our worth. And so what do we do? We can do all kinds of things like I did with the patio table. We can try to find shortcuts. We can take courses. We can do self-help things. We can apply affirmations. We can do all of these things we can engage in spiritual practice. And what we end up doing is that if the motivation for the spiritual practice or the exploration um, is, about, is about acquiring and getting, about pushing away something, then eventually 
It's like being blinded and we find ourselves back into the cave until we realize that all of these spiritual practices are traps, meaning it's important to do them. It's important to do them so that we get to the awareness that what is really the issue is the rusted belief of our own worth. I tell you this because I see that within myself. I look over the decades of, of spiritual longing and hunger and study and I can see that many times the motivations for that longing and the hunger was just to alleviate the pain. Sometimes I didn't even know what the pain was. Sometimes I couldn't even identify what the unrest was. I just wanted it to go away. And as I got older, and the more spiritual practices and methods I began to cultivate, I realized, and this is for me, that these practices and methods were really not the end-all, be-all. They were, as, as Baba Ram Das would say, traps. But it's necessary to go into the trap in order to uncover the realization that it is a trap so that you can then uncover yet the greater understanding of the reality that everything is based on somehow our love of self. So where are you? Truly, truly. I want, I want you to pause for a minute and, and uh, look around, see if anybody's watching you. <laughs> and ask yourself, do some personal inventory right now with regards to what do you sincerely, sincerely believe with regards to your worth? Because all that we have to do is to begin to look at the way we push uh, compliments away. All that we have to do is to look at the default of becoming so busy in helping other people in order to not really focus and look at our own actions. And all of this has gotten heightened because um, a film that I was a part of last year in 2020, uh, a film about Louise Hay, my, my first teacher, someone who was all about self-love, loving the self, that until we really become devoted to that in whatever way it works for us, then all of the other things will sort of be rusted and we'll just be painting it over and painting it over and painting it over, looking for solution and looking for solution and looking for solution. Is it this person? Is it this book? Is it this workshop? And we keep busying ourselves until we finally stop and go, all of this is just putting paint over rust until I really stop. And I go, hmm, I wonder why it is that I have such disregard for myself. I wonder why it is that I am so punishing to myself. Because it was Louise's experience and my observation that until we really process that at a granular level, and even if it's hokey, and even if it seems silly, that we stand in front of the mirror and we just keep saying to ourselves, I love you. I love you. I, I really love you. And we notice the nervous giggle. And we n notice the thought that says bullshit. And we notice all of the resistance. And we notice the seduction of busyness wanting us to pull us the way. And we notice all of these things until we keep dropping down and dropping down and dropping down and dropping down and realize we get to the rust. And we realize for ourselves that what we have done is that we have picked up the rusted opinions of others off of the curb of humanity. And that's what it is that we have been trying to decorate. Rather than to simply drive by that rusted out thing to examine what it is that we're aligning ourselves with and to remember that what we are is a shiny, new, untainted model of beauty 
a vessel of God. A vessel of God, a real vessel of God is not rusted. When you really explore your personal relationship with what is the God of your understanding, the God that would work for me would be a God that doesn't even identify or see the rust. But there is just a constant recognition of divinity back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. When I was at the retreat at the end of last year and the priest at the Jesuit retreat center was speaking, he, he said something quite profound and he said, the words behold and beheld. He said, we're very accustomed to the beholding of, of beholding God or beholding a wisdom that we feel is outside of us or beholding a standard. And he goes, but very often we give little credence to being beheld. Meaning that when I go into prayer, I am beholding an idea of a God that's listening. But do I really fully understand that I am constantly being beheld? Not because of my good deeds, but because I am worth. I am worth. I am love. There can be nothing other than being constantly beheld. I believe that that's one of the reasons why Ernest Holmes, the writer of The Science of Mind, would say, consider that you are especially looked after. I always loved that. Consider that you are always especially looked after. Consider the universe is looking at you that way, that you are being beheld in reverence without fault, without scorecard keeping of deeds. We do that. We do that because somewhere in the adolescence of public opinion, we have again picked up something off of the curve of public opinion that is rusted. We keep trying to improve the rust rather than just set the rust down. And so here we are. You and I, this morning, talking about this and looking, I'm looking at this. And all that really we can do is be willing to participate in high noticing. High noticing. The priest always said, notice that when someone says, I love you, how quickly we rush to say, I love you too rather than just pausing when someone says, I love you, and taking that in. Taking that in as a reminder of being beheld. By being beheld from someone who sees you. Hopefully being beheld in a light that doesn't love you from pity, but loves you for the fact that they see no rusted thinking, they see no costuming. They only see the beauty of who you are. Take that in before rushing to deflect and missing it by saying, I love you too. Because sometimes the rushing of, I love you too, is an example of not feeling that you're worth that, that offering. Take in the space of being beheld. What does this do for us? If my new motivation was the examination and the, 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 the heightened, intensified relationship with my worth, then as I understand in my experience of spiritual law to be, my world changes. Not from how generous I am, not from what a good person I try to be, but because deep down I am doing the work of reminding myself of my value. Value and worth does not, does not translate into ego. Oh, my friend, this does not mean entitlement. 
This is sort of understanding a spiritual Hippocratic oath of do no harm. But it isn't about hurting another physically. It's about doing no harm by not discounting yourself. A spiritual Hippocratic oath is really understanding that to the degree that you move into a new revelation of worth is the degree that the vibration and the energy of everyone around you feels the same permission. You're not proselytizing it. You're not saying, oh, look at me. You're just engaging in the work. And sort of like Plato's cave, you find a way to unlock yourself and see the shadows for what they are. See the rustedness for what it is. It's just the adoption of other opinion. It isn't, it isn't engaged in how can I make someone else think my way? There is so much separatism and division in thinking right now. I don't think it's mine to fix. I don't think trying to fix it is effective. What I believe is effective is to get quiet, do my work, honor, honor this, honor this instrument, this identity of David to the best of my ability, and then go and love people practice loving people. And I will confess in all transparency, it's been very hard. Loving people does not mean that you have to give space and oxygen to things that are unloving. It's just realizing that wherever they are on their path of self recognition, the recognition of their worth is where they are. And sometimes the best thing that we can do is to let them be where they are and not let our ego intervene and say, we have the right answer because maybe I don't. But I know what feels right to me. I know what feels honest to me. And trying to change someone else's opinion doesn't feel honest to me. What feels sincere is doing my work and understanding that there's only one organism, there's only one of us. If I take responsibility for doing my work, then it will be felt and it will have an impact. As I reflect on the documentary that came out yesterday in the New York Times in the op-ed section on Louise, um, I'm very grateful that I was able to participate in that. If you don't know what I'm thinking, uh, what I'm talking about, um, I was uh, asked to to be in a documentary, and be in the documentary simply means that I was interviewed extensively, hours upon hours. All of that has been reduced down to 17 minutes of showcasing Louise Hayes' work in the 1980s during the AIDS crisis. It was, uh, I, I didn't know that I would be the lone voice of the film. Um, I'm sort of classified as a narrator, but I'm not, I wasn't a narrator. He just took excerpts from our interview and he created the film around that. And my hope was that the conclusion would be that there is a difference between curing and healing. Healing is most likely to me with what we've been talking about today, setting aside the rest of nature. Curing is trying to paint over the rest, but healing is not identifying with it anymore. So scores of people, thousands of people have already seen the documentary as of today. And depending upon where they are, depending on individuals' beliefs, they, they receive it. 
the documentarian did exactly what good documentarians I feel should do and that is not to m make up your mind but let you decide and so there's been a flood of contact and text and emails and social media comments and I, I will leave you with this that in reflecting on my time with Louise there were probably a dozen of us who signed up to be caregivers for the critically ill, for those majority men who were experiencing the end stages of AIDS. And Louise gave a semi-formal training to us. And the main thing that she said was, don't make them entertain you. Don't make them feel as though it's their responsibility to put on a show or to, to appear to be anything other than where they are. Your job is to go in and let them connect to their peace, regardless of the degree of the horrific situation. Your job is to let them have a moment, a glimpse of being cared for of being loved, of being worthy. And the way that we would do that was we would take little bottles of lotion and we would rub their feet. And it's fascinating that when someone is at the end stages of their life, there isn't the resistance to receive. And I would get 10 people and I would go to their homes and feed their dogs and do those things. And then those 10 people would die. And I would get another 10 people. And then those 10 people would die. And there wasn't anyone in that who didn't allow me to rub their feet. And it's my prayer. And my hope that in the act of that, they felt worthy of it. And I'm thinking now in this moment, wouldn't it be nice if you and I didn't have to get so pushed into the corner of our melodramas that we have to become ill in order to be able to receive in order to begin to feel and understand our value our worth and of all of those individuals there was one there was one man i can't remember his name he was a devout buddhist um, he was unlike all of the other men that i would go and sit with there was a calm already there there was a resolution about eternality and the passing of the body and his body was covered with Kaposi sarcoma and um, but there was this inexplicable peace about him and I saw him for a couple of weeks before he transitioned and in those times I did what I I was trained to do and that was to try to not make him have to speak or do anything but he wanted to he wanted to talk and and he wanted to tell me about his understanding of, of the afterlife, of, of eternality, and how he was at peace with that. And there were beautiful conversations. And I remember him, I remember the light, and I remember the sweetness of his soul, and I remember him saying that in the end, all that matters is love. 
How well did you love? How well did you love yourself? Watching that documentary, seeing all of those people, revisiting all of that, I'm fascinated at how we forget. I'm fascinated at how acquisition and striving and even methods and practices can cloud us from this core central thing. And that is the realization that you and I are worthy. And it doesn't need to be earned. Whatever transpires in our world this week, that does not change that message. Whatever history reveals to us, that does not change that offering. And whatever, whatever befalls us in the physical world doesn't alter that truth. May we cease hurrying and busying ourselves to cover up our rust. And may we just set it down. And may we love. Thank you. Thank you for being with me today. Um, you can find the ways, if you're so moved, um, to offer your support. And I had a great time with Wisdom School at the end of last quarter, and I'm starting that up again in February. If you're interested, you'll find all of that information in the instructions of this video. And by all means, please go love yourself and love others. Take care.